it's 12.15, so we better, we be, better get started. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, my name is Richard Muirhead, and um, I'm with Fabric Ventures. Uh, I'm not Ben with Polychain. Um, so I'm, I'm standing in for him because uh, he wasn't able to, to make it. Um, uh, but the good news is that we've had a little chance to kind of powwow before this panel, so it's not entirely without preparation. Although I've just uh, raised the bar now for our, for our, our performance, um, but I want to uh, I want to we're going to have 45 minutes, uh, and the first 30 minutes uh, we'll take with some introductions and, and stories and, and and work through a few different questions. Um, but I would really seriously like to encourage you to put your uh, inquisitive kind of mindsets into gear uh, and to come up with with questions and to ask them, you know, whether or not you think they're kind of bang on relevant to everybody, because often they actually are. Um, and so you kind of do that through the 30 minutes, and then we'll kind of allow a good 15 minutes for, uh, for some deep, deeper questions after that. Does that sound like a good plan? Great, so uh, I'll give a little intro to myself, but not very much, just as it could by way of background. I was just listening to the, the chat about standard setting uh, earlier today. Uh, kind of, you know, Web3C and, and Oasis and, and so forth. And I think, you know, we're at a pretty important stage in the development um, of the space that we all clearly are kind of into. And um, I had the kind of opportunity, partly due to my age, um, to be involved in kind of the, the, the first phase of, or the, s the second phase of uh, web standard setting, but um, the mid-90s when we were kind of wrestling with some of the protocols to layer on top of the basic... Um, IP stack, and um, I certainly witnessed uh, the degree to which uh, standard setting can get co-opted by uh, major organizations and, and governments and so forth. And um, I think, it, therefore, you know, we need to be wary of that, but it's a, it's a very interesting balance being struck between uh, being wary of that and actually practically getting, getting stuff done and sponsored. So it's, it's pretty uh, interesting times. Uh, so I built a few companies after that and then um, started investing 10 years ago and, and working in uh, the crypto space five years ago, and I actually helped Pantera, or kind of led the Pantera investment in Bitstamp back in 2013, so I have some context for this panel. So um, without further ado, I'd like to the panelists to introduce them themselves. Uh, William here actually was, um, uh, for his sins, a, a strategy consultant, uh, but then he decided quite sensibly he wanted to actually get his hands dirty with building some stuff. Um, I'll let him uh, take it from there. Yeah, hi everyone. So uh, I'm William Picard, the managing director of uh, Gatecoin. So Gatecoin is a cryptocurrency trading platform, uh, initially based in Hong Kong. Uh, so it was created in 2013. Uh, we launched the product in January 2015. Um, <clears throat> then we we were the first one to list Ethereum. Uh, we we helped uh, different companies to to raise funds through ICOs. Um, we we listed uh, Tezos recently, and um, in March uh, this year, uh, we decided to set up the uh, the European office and uh, to develop the the operations in Europe. So uh, my job consists in uh, acquiring the proper uh, licensing setup for uh, for Gatecoin in Europe and uh, connecting with uh, European blockchain projects with uh, high potential so that we could develop uh, services on top of the exchange for them. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Richard, for hosting this panel you know, on Ben's behalf. You know, I, while he missed his flight, I'm like, he really did went out of his way you know, to not to you know, listen to me talk. So uh, uh, my, uh, my name is Rick Healy. Uh, I am the uh, co-founder of Autonomy. Uh, we are a uh, you know a uh, sell side trading desk uh, for um, crypto projects and crypto hedge funds, as well as a lot of the different uh, crypto exchanges. So we provide uh, liquidity to different uh, you know uh, crypto exchanges. Uh, 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 I would say you know crypto tokens, uh, as well as you know OTC services to uh, for different people to get in and out in you know, the fiat positions. Uh, we also have managing you know, a lot of the uh, provide the treasury management services for asset management of the different uh, you know crypto uh, wealthy families, crypto hedge funds, as well as well as the fundraising uh, fund raised from the crypto projects. So we're based in New York. Uh, half half of us based in New York. Uh, half of us based in Singapore. I'm actually currently you know based in New York City. So my background is actually uh, is purely uh, traditional financial background. So I. I 
uh, got into the commodity trading market in 2011 and uh, trading in the different financial institutions in New York. And the last job was uh, last year was actually managing the uh, energy futures contract for CME Group. Uh, so I was actually a uh, you know oil and gas guy, or as my people at CME call me, the uh, uh, Spark Boy, right? Because I was managing the uh, electricity contracts. Uh, Anyway, so that, that was me, and uh, you know uh, that was the uh, in the background of the team, and I uh, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, great. So, so we're going to kick off, um, uh, and we may be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but I think the the, the first question is, um, as we see um, more complex derivatives and and different types of secondary markets emerging, and maybe even decentralized exchanges, um, you know. How's that going to impact your business current, currently, and how's it going to impact the the established exchanges, and how must they evolve? William. Well, I think it's going to be well. Uh, what we need to to know is that uh, we are uh, at the middle age of the the cryptocurrency trading. At the moment, there are very little uh, financial instruments uh, to trade uh, cryptos, um, but. Um, as we see more and more complex products, uh, we will have more and more institutional investors uh, taking positions into uh, cryptocurrencies and then creating <coughs> more liquidity, uh, which should um, help uh, democratize the market. What um, I think the decentralized exchanges are something a bit different. Uh, this is not really for uh, like like uh, the traditional investors. It's more for it's going to be used later on for uh, crypto traders, um, only for crypto to crypto, because uh, of course, like uh, for crypto to chat, it, it doesn't really make sense to have uh, decentralized exchanges. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, decentralized exchanges are, uh, it's a very interesting uh, technology. Uh, I, I hope uh, there will be more liquidity on uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, uh, like uh, IDEX and so on, so, so that. Uh, uh, basically, that uh, we could limit the counterparty risk when trading cryptos. Um, however, uh, at the moment, uh, the liquidity is way too low, and centralized exchanges are, are still uh, the main uh, entry point for uh, for cryptos. So, liquidity is always a kind of a central po point of focus. Can we try and put some numbers around that? So, what's the li the liquidity of Bitcoin on a kind of daily basis? Yeah, I mean, just like, you know, uh, I, was, I was just checking on coin market cap, right? Right now, you're looking at the 3.5 billion, you know, dollars traded on Bitcoin, right? And daily volume wise. But How much I, of that is real? Yeah. Uh, you know, without, you know, if I knew everybody, I, I mean, at least, you know, I would say, you know, half of that or, or on ballpark, right? It's not real. Or how anybody actually could be able to quantify it, right? But, you know, uh, it's, it's more like a, it's more like you know those volumes, right? That does not really matter. Who is, who is fake? Because you know what what actually matters in the end is actually the liquidity, right? Just as William was put it, you know, we'll be able to buy and sell. We'll be able to have minimal slippage. We'll have the you know you know narrow spread. Those are the ones that are actually really going to incentivize people to participate, to trade, right? To actual liquidity that actually help out the, pretty much the entire industry, right? But those fake volumes, those are not. Those are helping out the ones who is creating it, right? That's not really. So the, just a way of. Faking it until you get you, it, real liquidity it, on your exchange. Yeah, it could really like you know, put it put it that way. But I also would like to basically uh, you know address like basically the question I had before about the you know complex derivatives, because that's really touches you know the the part that you know I want to talk about it. I think it, it's a it's a twofold question, right? And uh, it's, uh, I think the first question is that is really complex derivatives needed right now, right? And the second is that. You know where are we in terms of how to achieve that, right? I think the first question is definitely very much in need right now. I actually have you know clients and partners calling us you know a day before in the day before yesterday while I'm still traveling about you know how do we face this whole you know USDT situation, uh, you know <laughs> I always think I would call it instance or situation or any type of market volatility, right? So and that's actually also a bar for institutional investors getting because without complex derivative to manage your risk. Right, you nobody will feel comfortable, especially those pension funds and wealthy families or asset managers. Right, they wouldn't have the investment mandate; they will not be able to. And uh, for for that to happen, right, if you look at the course of the traditional market, I would say I would put my you know kudo hat on. Right, uh, whenever I have kudo contract in any of the uh, you know regions, right, futures contract, it always comes in first of all spot trading markets, right? People, you know, exchange hands, you know, the trading commodity, trading, you know, barrel of crude oils, and then goes in futures, 
right? Futures market building, and then people say, okay, enough liquidity on the future side, and then people go in options, right? And options comes in, and then they're gonna spread options, all the complex derivatives, and that's where the secondary market kicks in. So, okay, with all the liquidity there, I, as a market maker, I'll be offering you complex, you know, structured products. You know, could all your, you know, all, uh, contract between 60 and 80, I'll take the risk. The rest, you know, you're covered. Right, you know, stuff like that. So I think put that in the analogy of the- What's stopping people deploying that right now? Yeah, exactly, right. That's the second question, that's the second question comes in as of like, you know, Gatecoin, right? It right now is, you know, I'm sorry, I haven't checked it. If you're not actually offering complex options contracts, then there's no way for me, if, if the clients ask me, Ricky, I want this strata of options that I want to limit my, you know, you know, my current portfolio, I don't doubt in Bitcoin into the risk of between 6,000 and 8,000. 8, I want that. You can charge me, I don't know, 2% or whatever premium you want to, uh, I'll take it. But I still won't be able to sell that product to, to the clients to help them manage the risk because there's no way for me to manage risk. Hmm. Right. That's well, where the exchanges well, comes in. Right. Yeah, the problem for um, an exchange like ours is that we need to provide um, like services uh, for uh, retail users because the market is very retail at the moment and also think about the future and uh, consider that the volumes in the, the foreseeable future will be generated by institutional investors. So uh, we need to position ourselves that we can uh, provide like simple uh, trading services for uh, retail traders because at the moment that's what's driving uh, volumes and uh, like working on uh, more uh, mid long term uh, services uh, for for more uh, adsense traders and this is a trade off. So, so we didn't talk about this uh, before we touched on some of these points but um, you know, you could summarize in a sense the kind of the, the all the profits being made in crypto at the moment is coming from like ten to twenty percent of uh, traders who trade intensively on these exchanges, um, and maybe they used to be spread betting or some other kind of such activity, and now this is what they're doing, and so we're building all of this infrastructure to support the making of profits from those people. Uh, and to, uh, at the moment, is this is this a worthy thing for us to be doing? Does this help? The Web three movement. Well, well <clears throat> so thank thank you, Richard, for not you know saying those people, not actually you know pointing fin finger at me. But uh, yes, it's very much worth it. Uh, and then it's 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 more like uh, you know uh, w w I just want to clarify like what we do right in, in terms of trading on it right. It's it's more like you know so Richard, you want to buy or sell you know uh, Bitcoin, and William, you want to buy or sell Bitcoin. If you guys happen to be know each other, and actually just exchange hands and trade it, you get the best price ever, right? And also it happens at the same time. By being a liquidity provider, for me, it's like you want to buy and sell Bitcoin today, but we don't want to buy and sell Bitcoin tomorrow. You guys have a mismatch. And also have a price mismatch between your expectations. And then I'll be the market maker. Okay, I'll take the risk. I'll take your Bitcoin. I'll buy it from you from you know, 6,600, right? And tomorrow I'll, I'll sell to you know, William at 6,700. But in between, I'm actually exposed to the market risk for one day, but I'm compensated for it. Right. For that, that's what, that's what we usually do, right? Basically, we pay by the, we charge people premium because of the risk taking. And also we do that statistically, you know, using our techniques, so analyzing whatever we do, right? Machine learning, you could classify, classify any of that activities. But in the meantime, right, people for, for, in, for institutions invest in traders like us to be able to provide liquidity on the exchange, right? We're closing down those spreads, and uh, in, the, in the end, what we have, what, what you get is that, you have a very liquid OTC and uh, you know exchange market where guys like you know you guys or any of the other trade in, uh, retail or institutions can go in and get the price they want at the moment, right? So, I think so, so those people with capital can make more capital, but but how does this really help the the broader movement towards decentralized applications and, and Web three? It's a bit uh, counterintuitive, but uh, actually uh, bringing capital, uh, bringing liquidity to those markets help making uh, the decentralized applications that are using the tokens more mainstream because um, it reduces the, the, the price gap, okay? Um, <clears throat> and by, by reducing the, the price gap, the buy sell gap, it makes those uh, like, like uh, utility tokens uh, affordable and usable, uh, so. Okay, so that's, I think it's a, um, a little bit of a good segue. Um, we um, at sort of Fabric Ventures, uh, whilst we think that there are going to be lots of forms of money created, you know, in this new, um, you know, uh, cryptocurrency ap approach, 
uh, and they have been. Um, we, we're not a big fan of kind of um, new forms of, of payment within specific digital economies. Uh, we think it's pretty hard to create your own new form of or means of payment. Uh, but we are a fan of, of kind of utility uh, tokens and the role they may play in the future. But it, um, there's now an increasing amount of talk about um, the fact that if tokens do have utility, then those uh, token holders actually need to do something with them uh, to be active participants within networks. So given you mentioned the utility word, how do exchanges um, operate? What is their function in a world where tokens are not just, uh, can't just sit in exchange hosted wallets? Well, actually, to be honest, we are not there yet because uh, most of the uh, decentralized applications that are being created uh, <coughs> are not, I mean, like, like, like the applications don't work or not live yet. Um, but uh, in the future, uh, and it's it's coming uh, real soon, uh, there there will be a role when uh, users would have like a Bitcoins or a Ethereum or uh, just fiat currencies and they would like to use, uh, like to, to get access to, to a network, to a service uh, by and using those utility tokens, they could like just convert straight away. And let's, and let's uh, give some examples that might be for uh, transcoding uh, decentralized cloud peer, computing. Or yeah, or, or yeah, governance. Yeah. Sure, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so the, yeah, let's say uh, decentralized uh, cloud storage or cloud computing. Basically, you want to access uh, this network, you need to, to, to use the, the, the tokens, but you don't have the token yet, you just have Bitcoin and so on, like the exchange would act as a, like a conversion uh, platform so that you can access the network. Uh, it's very simple, but for this you need to have liquidity to have like this very simple service. You need to have uh, lots of institutional investors, lots of uh, people that are uh, basically setting uh, an affordable price. I mean by that reducing the spread. Uh, otherwise, basically the, the service would be way too expensive. I, th I think that's actually uh, sorry. I think that's actually very valid point, right? But, but I would say it, I think that's that's already here because. You know, it, it's more, it's less of, I think it's, it's less of an exchange, but more of on, on the wallet side, right? Just like a uh, recent example of Binance reinvesting, uh, I forgot, Trust Wallet, and one of the wallet, you know, uh, I mean, there's an absolutely specific reason. We talk with CZ and all that, right? The why they want to invest in it. Because it, it provides a front end for the guys who will use the token as a utility. It is a gateway for them to buy and sell the token on chain. Right. For that, you don't have to go register another uh, account at Binance and go through the KYC process and hoping that Binance return the token back if they get hacked, you know, stuff like that. If you actually get, avoid all of that, then an easy gateway is from the wallet and also linked to a decentralized exchanges on chain with enough liquidity. That's a lot of, that's a lot of ifs I'm putting here, right? But with all that in, in the utopian world, if that actually happens, then you know, it will be very, very, you know, very, very encouraging for the for the adoption of the, any of the utility tokens, right? But I think it's getting there. Yeah. So this the the adopt maybe you know allows people to buy them, but what about actually then participating in the networks? Will you do that from Trust Wallet? I mean, how will you? I think if you put everything on chain, it's it's possible, right? It depends on what what the wallet producers wants to. If you actually decide so, okay, I'm gonna actually do be a node in any of the depots depots you know you know network, it's completely doable. Actually, people are actually talking about it. See, if I don't, you see anybody doing that? Uh, I think they're actually contemplating the idea, but I can't say who's doing that. Me neither. <laughs> but yes, I do yes. see some. I'm pretty sure you probably come across yeah. some of that. Yeah, for sure. As well. yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, what, what is interesting is like we, we can see like uh, that at the moment you have a Huobi or or a Bitfinex that are using the uh, the for example EOS uh, tokens like to get like an additional revenue streams. So uh, at the moment there are the the users uh, that are letting their their coins on those uh, exchanges are not profiting from 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 them but it's very likely that in the future we would see exchanges uh, basically ch sharing the the revenues of uh, you know because like in some chains like uh, uh, Tezos you can you can actually uh, uh, validate uh, transactions and so on just by uh, by staking coins um, and uh, get rewarded for that, exactly like miners, but it's proof of stake. And 
basically we could imagine that uh, in the future there will be exchanges sharing the revenues from it. So uh, for for this you need to be um, to be a centralized uh, exchange. Uh, so that's uh, an interesting uh, differentiation point and uh, uh, from uh, from decentralized exchange that will be just used for trading. Yeah, so, that, yeah. so that, that has been mm -hmm. raised as a point that you, uh, there may be a movement towards decentralized exchanges for crypto, but then in order to actually stake them and have the rewards, you then end up being re-centralized again, possibly, with economies of scale. So we um, feel free to come up with another uh, another point you want to make, Ricky, but but you mentioned the p point about KYC within the wallet, and obviously that you know, creates a convenience uh, that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. Um, how do you see that evolving within the kind of crypto capital markets? Do you see, you know, KYC and AML remaining kind of at the on-ramp? I mean, remaining. Remaining at the on-ramp in some cases and not necessarily <laughs> existing at all in other cases. And, uh, or, or and how do you see the trend towards what some people call kind of KYT in, in terms of K, know your transaction <coughs> Uh, and sort of on the wire capabilities of of checking that each transaction was a compliant one, you know, between uh, compliant participants and so forth. Yeah, I would say you know the KYT process. I'm, I'm just like good luck with that, right? It's it's it's, it's <laughs> if people can do that, I would definitely buy that solution, right? Uh, so uh, I think I think. Uh, but there are folks like Harbor and so forth trying to to, to build those technologies. I don't know if you. Yeah. 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 So uh, I, I would say like there's there's two I think two streams going on in the KYC process right especially in crypto right For, first one is actually on chain solutions right a lot of people are tracing you know building software building you know, solutions to tracing the wallet address you know transfers because it's all public right and people to link it back to the KYC information that has been done through on the exchange side or through the other OTC counterparty side but for those it's 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 you basically you're you're chasing a, you're chasing a ghost right that's trying to hide itself I think it's 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 very very challenging. And in the meantime, you have the traditional process of KYC people when you do OTC trading, same way with other commodities or equities, right? I, you know, we trade with, you know, Richard trade with me, I collect your information, passport, corporate information, all that, put it into my compliance officers, have them review and record it. If anybody asks me CFTC or SEC, hopefully not. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll provide information to them, say, okay, here's why we do the trade with Richard, right? So there's two streams going on. Uh, I don't think neither of them actually gonna be surfaced by itself. I think it's probably going to be the combination of both, and uh, also with definitely with the guidance and from the, from the regulators. Uh, but the, the the funny part is that right, just cause I, cause because my background is CME, right? I, I talk with CFTC guys a lot. The CFTC, CFTC guys is common is that I'm looking for guidance from your side. From explain your side. who those guys are for. Oh, Not everybody may know the CFTC. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, CFTC is actually the uh, regulatory body in the U.S. that actually uh, you know regulates the commodities market. It's got, uh, yeah, and and they they basically the one that actually regulates the current uh, Bitcoin futures contracts that actually uh, traded on CME and the CBOE, which is the I think the two of the largest uh, derivatives exchange in the world. Uh, so yeah, they 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 basically currently are the um, I would say legal, uh, 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 I would say regulators actually for the Bitcoin markets in the U.S. Uh, so yeah, back to the point. Basically, uh, when I talk with them, right. Uh, they are short staffed. Now, the first thing they admit is that they're short staffed. I'm like, okay. Uh, it's like, but you know, you need to regulate us because if you don't regulate us, retail customer won't trust us enough to trade it, and the industry will not grow. I'm like, okay, great. Tell us how, how tell us how you do, how you guys want to be self-regulated, or how do you want to be regulated by us? And we're like, uh, we want you to tell us how we should be regulated by you. Right, so it becomes a chicken and egg problem. It was a very interesting I, I conversation think, in Washington. I think in the U.S. in particular, they like to play that that game. Exactly. Like, we're not going to tell you exactly what to, to do, yeah. but if you do the wrong thing, then we'll come after you. We'll come after you, and we'll have seven years to trace back. So yeah. seven years, <laughs> right? So that will, you know, which is an advantage for for Europe. Actually, maybe um, maybe we can switch gears a little yeah. bit before going back to the. Uh, KYT question, mm -hmm. which is that I know Ricky, you, you know, you, actually both of you have a bit of a kind of global perspective on yeah. things. Um, uh, I was at uh, San Francisco Blockchain Week or whatever, and uh, Europe was not particularly well represented there, um, as it happens. Um, there was a lot of you know, West Coast and Asian activity. Um, just William, why don't you go first, and then Ricky, your perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, regarding the KYT, I think it's a very, very interesting. Um, model to um, 
to screen uh, to screen tri crypto to crypto trading and crypto to crypto transactions. Actually, uh, at Gitcoin, we are using a solution like this, uh, a kind of similar to a chain analysis. Um, and uh, and uh, we could see that this, the solution so only after approved. the fact. You're not use, you're not trying to um, uh, do anything within the transactions themselves. You're just looking at the transactions afterwards and checking that they were compliant. Yeah, exactly. Um, and um, and I, I agree with uh, with Ricky actually. Uh, like uh, the combination of both will be uh, a proper uh, would be uh, quite adequate. Um, uh, on on a crypto to crypto trading, there will be KYT, and for a crypto to fiat, uh, basically we need to adopt the same uh, standards as the uh, uh, forex trading standards. Actually, uh, because in the end we are dealing with uh, currencies, so um, uh, we need to apply a KYC, and and like it, it, it's very common practice. I, I mean, we, you described them uh, quite uh, quite accurately. Um, but yeah, what, what is a, a bit complex is to explain to uh, the different uh, regulators, and uh, it's not only uh, in the US, uh, it's, it's also uh, in Europe, um, uh, basically uh, how, like, uh, how does it work, like the KYT, why uh, it is possible, and then you need to explain what blockchain is. <laughs> so uh, y y it's really, really uh, complex to uh, to get in touch with regulators because they lack knowledge uh, related to uh, our core business, actually, and uh, and innovation. So um, <clears throat> so that's why it's taking time, but uh, we'll get there hopefully. So so when I come back and talk about regulation and and the existing markets and how they might adopt both, you know. You know, crypto assets and also uh, regulation and what that's going to mean for you know the nascent crypto capital markets. So we sort of get thinking about that. But I want to go back to this this question just broadly about the um, European ecosystem versus the Asian and, and American. Um, Ricky, do you have any thoughts? Uh, you mean the whole like crypto, uh, capital market ecosystem? More broadly, just crypto in general. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so you know, uh, we we pretty much like you know have office uh, resides in Singapore and U.S. Right. So basically, I think we can speak for Europe. Uh, uh, so for for Asian side uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for Asian side, it's more like you know once I think the the one of the historical milestone or events happening is like July, uh, September fourth, right, two thousand seventeen, when when China decides to ban uh, the ICO activities and also the. Uh, uh, the, the 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 trading uh, activities overall and uh, in in China that actually sort of pushes out all the capital market participants into Japan, uh, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and I think among all of them, right, uh, Korean is a market by its own, right. Everybody knows Korean guys likes to trade. You know, actually they are actually have. I'm not making this up. Actually, they uh, they they have a. I think they issued a regulation that for high school and anybody who's be below age of high school students and uh, above age of 65, not allowed to trade in retail with retail on crypto. I'm like when I saw saw that news, I'm like this is a really hidden market, right? Uh, if you think about it, right? The regulation says you cannot trade. Uh, anyway, uh, and also you know the Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, they are actually more of the traditional. But they have a, don't they have a, the regulatory setup in Korea is is kind of like it has to be explicitly allowed mm -hmm. for for you to do something. Isn't that one of the cha that that's confuses the message that comes out of Korea? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, right, right now, I think the uh, the conclusion from that side is that uh, they are try they all the exchanges like Bitam update all that right. I'm not bit Bitam just got sold. But anyway, all the exchanges, the regulators are trying to say, okay, because of the recent hacks, a series of hacks that happened there. They are actually says, okay, we need to put a regulation on the exchanges at least, because that's where the retail customers get impacted the most, right? But in terms of overall encouraging trading, encouraging the retail trading, the Korean government has always been, you, know, you guys go for it. But if we reach to a point that you know these innocent high school students or junior high school students or the guys, uh, the, the 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 more like uh, senior people who is basically holding their retirement fund, uh, fund right? Starts to dive into the market without knowing anything, uh, creates some of the social problems. That's why the regulation comes sure. down to, and that's where we know that it's actually that crazy or not created, right? But you would say in Asia, it's pretty clear where the the hubs are for crypto activity. Yeah. 
not just trading, but also other development activity? Oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. right. It's like the constant talk to the, even the U.S. Uh, guys, right? They're actually moving their companies to Singapore. I actually just, and they check it out, the, those places, and felt like it's actually a great place to live. They actually just moved the team over there. It actually, that happened a lot when the U.S. side, especially SEC, right, would never, uh, SEC is the uh, security regulators in, in U.S., whenever, you know, Chairman Jay Clayton opened up his mouth, there's like at least two or three more companies moving from U.S. to Singapore. Yeah, every single time. Uh, and we see it all the time. Uh, but not to uh, London or Berlin or um, Actually, not part. I'm not quite so sure, actually. Because Singapore and the Hong Kong, the government, they're very, very clear sort of like stance, right? We're crypto friendly, especially Singapore. We're crypto friendly. We're going to make this work. Don't worry about it. It's already a new asset class. We're not going to put it under a category of you know, equity or, or commodities. So you guys don't have to worry about it. But we're going to take our time to figure out how we do regulate this new asset class, right? So that sort of puts your mind at ease, right? Mm -hmm. And for the U.S. side, I guess probably you guys are already very familiar with. Or, yeah, go ahead. Okay. William, quick one. Uh, yeah, I've been working uh, for four years uh, in Hong Kong on the trading platform. So I know uh, a bit of the uh, Hong Kong's market and the, uh, the Chinese market uh, about crypto. Um, I, I think... Uh, like in Europe, co co compared with Europe, like uh, th those markets are <coughs> are uh, much more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, money focused. So uh, I mean by that, there are uh, much more much more investments, uh, much larger investments uh, in the crypto space uh, in uh, in mainland China and and Hong Kong. Um, however, it seems that the uh, uh, the blockchain projects, the the developers. Uh, are uh, are have more potentially in Europe. Uh, also, um, w what is quite interesting to see is uh, is that uh, in Europe uh, you have uh, regulators that are that have a proactive stance when it comes to cryptocurrencies, uh, ICOs, and um, and uh, to and 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 basically uh, we had the opportunity several times uh, already to to meet. Uh, uh, High-level uh, political uh, leaders uh, in in France and, and in other countries to uh, to work on a regulatory framework to give uh, feedbacks uh, like on the upcoming uh, framework. So uh, it's it's very different in in Hong Kong, for example. In Hong Kong, uh, I've never been able uh, to connect with uh, with the HKMS, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, uh, um, and um, and help uh, define uh, like. Like basically giving feedbacks to to define a legal framework for a, a cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency trading, um, and it was the same with banks uh, in Europe. Uh, you uh, can connect with uh, the head of uh, compliance of a large bank uh, to discuss about the uh, cryptocurrencies and and, and your business. Uh, while uh, in Hong Kong uh, and in mainland China, it was uh, much more uh, complicated. So there is less hostility uh, with. Uh, about uh, cryptocurrencies. Got it. So, so we you know, we certainly think that some of the jurisdictional competition to be a, a great and um, you know welcoming environment from a regulatory perspective within Europe is one of its uh, uh, inherent advantages. Um, uh, but if we if we go back, actually, I was just reading that um, you know there are the little story about uh, a congressional hearing regarding the Mount Gox. Um, you know, implosion, and in particular about um, the fact that it, it might be possible to trace where some of the uh, the Bitcoin had gone uh, using chain analysis. In fact, mm. um, and uh, I haven't dug into the, into the specifics of it, but um, I guess that's kind of the point, which is that um, once the regulators understand, once they understand what blockchain is, and once they understand also that you can have an awful lot of uh, transparency and, and, and hence data, and in fact automation of a lot of key compliance and taxation uh, requirements that they have, um, I have certainly uh, always believed in, and seen uh, to an increasing degree that you're gonna have what I think of as a kind of almost a flippening, that, you, that you're gonna see uh, that driven, in fact, by governments, regulators, and so forth, you will have a move towards more crypto-centric you know, capital markets. So as that happens, as you see traditional exchanges bring on crypto assets, um, as we see regulation get enforced upon uh, you know, today's exchanges, um, 
you know, how is that going to impact the, the the market? Is this is this a, a an opportunity for you? Is it a is a threat? And also, how do we stop uh, these fantastic characteristics uh, of crypto becoming a kind of weapon in the hands of uh, government? Okay, um, so. I think it's a fantastic opportunity, uh, and, uh, and it's funny because um, uh, so uh, four, year, four years ago, uh, when I when I started uh, working on the uh, crypto trading uh, exchange, uh, I, I, I when I uh, when I was saying that uh, regulation was a uh, was an opportunity for for the cryptocurrency ecosystem, uh, it was uh, it was really uh, horrible for me. <laughs> it was uh, everybody was. Uh, was uh, like uh, blaming me for for having this point of view, and and I I think it really legitimizes the um, the uh, the ecosystem. Uh, it helps um, making uh, cryptocurrency more mainstream, um, and um, and on the other hand, as a as a business, it it's uh, it's going to be also more more complex, more challenging to. Uh, to um, to deal with uh, with uh, compliance, uh, like uh, it it will require additional investments. Maybe it it might be a, a bit less uh, profitable because you cannot necessarily uh, automate everything when it comes to compliance. Um, but overall, uh, we think that it's going to uh, boost. I mean, like the mainstream adoption. So, Ricky, your thoughts, and uh, we're going to go to questions immediately after Ricky's finished. So, any hands up? I can prepare. Okay, go, Ricky. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so I think with the traditional exchanges entering this market or more regulation comes down to the existing exchanges. So I think, you know, this is one like an anecdote I would share, right? It's like I was just talking to the same you guys for, for a while and, uh, you know, those are my you know, former colleagues, right? It's like uh, I think a team at Core, I think global head of the Bitcoin futures con uh, contracts in the CME. I was like, you know, why do you guys put such a high margin in the, in the contract that prevent people to trade, to have more liquidity? And they're like, when well, taking your time, I'm like, but in the meantime, you know, BitMEX and OKX or other exchanges in the future contract are trading like 10 times or even 20 times more than your volume. Uh, I guess worry. And it's like, no, and we don't. Uh, he said, I quote, right? Uh, we're not worried about uh, the current volume because uh, we know where it ends, right? So in their perspective, you know, it doesn't matter what the current crypto, crypto exchanges, I'm so sorry, William, yeah, yeah. Or, or other, other exchanges come down to, uh, is that in the end, it's going to be a regulation game. Mm -hmm. Whoever has the biggest balance sheet, mm -hmm. a lot of credits, uh, exist uh, in a mature system of you know, margin, margin management, all that, will win the game. Mm -hmm. Or later on, maybe because we'll get merged, okay, we'll get acquired. It doesn't matter, but in the end, if actually the, the exchange game, is, uh, in their perspective, I'm just quoting, is that it's going to be a, a balance sheet game, a credibility game. Mm -hmm. So that, you know. When is that going to happen? Well, definitely, they hope it is to be sooner, but I think it's going to be a long time. What's right. long? Uh, I, I, I would say at least in the next two to three hours, uh, two to three years. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's crypto time scale. <laughs> that, that that is absolutely even more valid. All right. So, uh, but <laughs> this, this good. I'm going to go going to go to questions if if that's okay. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Over. Um, yeah. Got it. Um, close. So we'll just go with Alex first. Can you introduce yourself quickly? Um, um, Dizzy, well, just like, where, who are you? Where are you from? I'm Which? Alex, I'm working on Gorman and decentralized application. And oh, cool. what I'm interested in is uh, the KYT and yes. the, can you describe a bit more how it works and how it affects privacy? Because uh, there is an effort in the um, decentralized community to create some privacy uh, protected technologies like zero, zero knowledge stuff and uh, private, private uh, coins with confidential transactions. So, like, will uh, KYT and this kind of regulation be possible with those types of assets? And mm. generally, how it works in mm. the we, we, we're going to gather a couple of questions and then try and hit the most of you. Both have a think about that one. Good, great question, by the way. Thank you. Someone got a mic? For, or, or can you shout? Just stand up and shout. Just intro yourself quickly, please. Thanks.
Got it. So we've got KYT, can it preserve privacy, regulatory status of, of market making? Another good question. More? Just here. Um, hi, I'm Florian. Um, you Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Germany. <coughs> just, um, just checking if you're with a regulator or something like this. Yeah. somebody that also wants to take the other side, but these market makers come and they want to make a profit, so at, at the end you pay a lot of money. Uh, and you talked a lot, a lot about all that market makers do like a good service. I mean, I think there is already a very good alternative that's called Bancor. Uh, I know there's a lot of bad press about it, uh, but I would like to, to hear your thought on that, because from, from my view, like in Bancor you can provide liquidity actually get paid a little bit because you can get like whatever fee you can choose like 0.2% uh, and uh, that there's no more market makers in between and you know what price you will get and um, mm. I think it's it should yep. be adopted more but uh, unfortunately nobody understands this so <laughs> regulatory status of market makers alternatives to market makers can we pick up another one Good question. I, I think we'll see that openness of data applied to lots of other kinds of markets, actually, as well, in, in the decentralized space. Um, should we take, try and take those four together? Yeah? Okay, why? Because the, the first two kind of related, so market makers, regulation, and alternatives. First one, no transaction, and okay. third one, open data. Talk about the KYT part. Oh, okay, okay. Market. Okay, um, so uh, regarding the KYT, uh, it, it's quite simple actually. Uh, it's uh, fine. every every time you deposit coins on the exchange, basically uh, you, we are going to use a service uh, that will make sure that the the coins or uh, like a, not a significant portion of the coins are not coming from a ransomware, uh, the dark web, like any illegal activities that you can do with uh, with cryptocurrencies and um, or a hack or anything like this. If uh, like the the risk score of the deposits that you've made is superior uh, at a certain level, then uh, we 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 would need to freeze uh, the uh, the assets that have been deposited and uh, undergo a, a, an investigation uh, to see uh, where that does that com does that come from and so on. Uh, so this is by essence uh, like the, the KYT uh, service. So um, <clears throat> it, it, it has <clears throat> like uh, having softwares like this, it really helps uh, working with, um, with banks. Um, so basically uh, operating a, uh, a crypto to fiat exchange. Um, Sounds like it'd be good to know what those thresholds are if you're wanting to uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get yeah, through. Yeah, so yeah. But, uh, uh, I think yeah. the question also related to kind of more sort of, should we say, uh, sophisticated approaches to masking identity or kind of... Well, how, does, how is privacy affected by this? Because if, you, if, if I can preserve my privacy, you won't be able to investigate the transaction track of my coins, right? Yeah, so indeed, uh, for example, uh, like... <clears throat> So then it depends on the the exchange the the so uh, the software that is being used uh, provide uh, risk scores but then it's up to 
the exchange or the the, the client uh, to define uh, the risk scores depending on different categories. Like you have a like Bitcoin mixers, so you, you said okay, so if uh, like a, a fifty percent of the coins are deriving from a Bitcoin mixer, then I, I said uh, I don't know uh, which risk score, but it it's not uh, defined by the uh, the software. It's defined by the user of the software. So. Uh, then you need to to adjust uh, accordingly and and also uh, to to uh, to define the standards along with uh, your banking partner. Cool. I know there's lots more in that that space, but maybe go on the market makers point and open sure. if you have a comment. Uh, I, I think I could take uh, you know, two questions from from the market makers. I think uh, if I recall, one from the regulatory uh, stance on the you know different uh, regions uh, on the market maker, and second of all is that you know why is market maker needed and why do we not. You know, just trade without market maker, right? Correct. Yep. Sure. Uh, I think first of all, you know, uh, I think uh, as one of the few market makers in the, in this space, autonomy, right? and uh, um, I think you know because there are so few of us, you know, please, you know, don't not uh, do not actually you know uh, think we're actually doing anything like you know magical or or crazy or we're doing exactly the same thing as in any of the traditional markets. Seriously, because uh, you know it's more like you know because I come from both world, I kind of kind of see both world. Because when I actually at the CME group, right? You know, first thing we when, first thing after we create the new say futures contract for crude oil or natural gas is that I call up market makers, right? The RW guys, you know, virtual guys, two sigma guys. Uh, please, here's a maker take a rebate. Here's the contracts. Please make a market for the next three months. I'll pay your fees. That's it, right? And when, you know, market makers comes in quoting on both sides of the work. And in that case, they're using they're using our pro, own, their own private property money to trade, to just as anybody else in the market. So there's really not quite a licensing requirement a requirement for that, especially when it comes down to the uh, uh, commodities or spot market, right? Just go here and trade. Uh, and in the, in the equities market, of course, you know you will need a license, a broker dealer license here to to trade that. But the question, the problem right now is that and my problem is more of like a, the ongoing effort is that we are still trying to figure out how do we Categorize the the uh, uh, the different cryptocurrencies, right? Besides Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum in the U.S. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm talking the U.S. landscape right now. Uh, so in that case, you know, before they can actually categorize them, then the licensing requirement will come there after the categorization. So for that, you know, everybody's sort of operating in a gray area, uh, meaning that you know we checked with legal counsel, and pretty sure all the other market makers checked their legal counsel that you're not violating the law or regulation because it has not actually comes down to that yet. But uh, according to the traditional market, as long as you do stuff, you know, self-regulate yourself, right? Do not do crazy things like, you know, wash trading, spoofing, all that. Hopefully, there's no regulators here, you know, because those are the I know sensitive word. <laughs> Disregard me. I'm saying that in a very, very negative way, right? And those things are not allowed in this market. And as long as you do keep doing what you're supposed to do in the traditional market, and you're you're fine. It's it's you know, when the regulation comes in, get your license. You know, report whatever transaction you have in your databases to the regulators. Then I don't see any reason that will you know will, will cause a problem for you. So yeah. we, we're probably gonna have to wrap it up there. I think time wise. Um, uh, I know that we've got the question of alternatives to to uh, market makers still outstanding, and also this very interesting question about uh, the openness of data going forth. And I think. That, that can also relate, frankly, to the privacy question. But I'd just like to thank Ricky and thank William and thank the audience for participating. And uh, see you guys later and girls. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>